And so the nature, I mean, I've just discussed the nature of county lines is heroin and crack cocaine, right? So, you know, there's a chemical hook there. So the d demand, regardless of what's happening in the environment, the, in the demand has not decreased. Um, drug supply networks being what they are, ingenious, always tend to be one step ahead. We'll always find a way to get the drugs to those customers. And that's exactly what's happened over COVID. And prices as well, stayed gone up a little bit. Yeah, the well, varying responses really from the people that we spoke to. So some areas in the country reported an increase in price. Um, again, some areas didn't. Those areas that didn't report an increase in price, what they did see was uh, a decrease in purity. The Leggett podcast is sponsored by Montrex. Montrex is a cutting edge sportswear brand empowering athletes across the world, built to enhance performance and give you confidence to go the extra mile. They've got some of the most incredible products at montrex.com. There is a link below this video. Click the link and at checkout, enter the code LEGIT for 15% off your order. That's L-E-G-I-T, all one word. Everything from jackets, cargo pants, gym tops, t-shirts, uh, running jackets, running pants, Everything is on their website and they sponsor some of the most incredible athletes. Everything from UFC fighter Leon Edwards and a good friend of the podcast, uh, boxer Jazza Dickens. So click the link below, use the code LEGIT at checkout for 15% off your order. Right, it's the LEGIT podcast with myself, Tom Wickstead. It's me, Andy Grant, and this week's guest is Dr. Grace Robinson. Hi. Thank you for coming back for part two. Thank you for having me. But first, we must mention uh, Montrex. Uh, obviously sponsoring the podcast from now on so um we're both uh montrex up. montrexed up to the hills and there is a link below this uh on the in the description click the link and make sure when you check out use the code legit l-e-g-i-t um for 15 percent off and um, so they're sponsoring the podcast from now on incredible company yeah, give them a follow on Instagram. Brilliant. All the gear is boss. Um, and yeah, you get 15% off. So nice one, Montrex. Yeah. Thank you, Montrex, as well. To our guest, you made us a promise and you stuck to it. You said you'd come back on and let us know about your findings. We first got you on probably six months into the pandemic. Mm -hmm. You were doing research with Nottingham University over the impact of COVID on county lines, right? Right. We are now 16 months in. And we have some findings. We have three some. policy briefings. So the last time I came in September, it was, I'd only just started the research, I'd only just started the job, moved to Nottingham the day after the, the podcast and sort of only really just starting to get into these findings. Now, um, yeah, almost 10 months down the line, we have spoken to 42 people for this research from across the country. Uh, we've published three policy briefings and our last one was published last Thursday, which you're holding right now. An exclusive. Right. So 43, 43 people. 42. 42 people from a range of different backgrounds on the impact that they've had personally because of COVID relating to county lines. Is that So mainly those we've spoken to have worked in frontline agencies. So those addressing right. county lines, those working day to day with children that are impacted by county lines that are at risk of child criminal exploitation. So for example, we've spoken to um, quite a lot of police for this, those in territorial police forces, those in the regional organised crime units and those from the National County Lines Coordination Centre. And as well as that, as that, we've spoken to people in local authorities, so from youth offending teams, for example, from probation. We've spoken to third sector organisations, so the Children's Society, um, St Giles, for example. Anyone really who is on the front line trying to address this issue. So we've briefly been trying to explore how their sort of organisation has changed during COVID-19 to keep up with the pandemic how um, the council lines model has been impacted itself and also obviously the risk to children and young people and how vulnerabilities changed basically so that that are three main sort of themes is what we've been looking at do you think could we just like i know we talked about it on on the first part part one county lines but just for people who don't know it, obviously we we all us three all know what county lines is but what is county lines for people who don't know what it is County Lines, in its most simplistic form, is the migration from one area to another to supply drugs. Tend to be crack cocaine and heroin, but there are certain drug networks that will offer additional drugs like cannabis. Xanax is becoming quite popular 
Really? Yeah. Um, What's a Xanax do, sorry? Uh, I think it's a... It's like antidepressant. Yeah, antidepressant, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's becoming quite popular. Um, it's massive in the States. Anecdotally, there's an increase in um, school children taking Xanax. You know, there's been such a... Children have been at home for so long and the anxiety has really grown and they've got back into a school system routine that they're struggling with and in order to sort of calm themselves down to go to the school playground we have had some reports that children are taking like a little tab of xanax my god that's mad isn't it yeah Fuck very an- anecdotally know. not much evidence of that at the minute but yeah, it's very addictive these, xanax as well yeah it is and yeah some of these counter lines networks are supplying other drugs but it does tend to be crack cocaine and heroin it's not a new process criminal exploitation isn't a new process the movement of drugs has been happening for decades the reason why it's really come into public consciousness is because of the decreasingly young age of children that have become involved and obviously the levels of violence so you know struggle to pick up a newspaper from day to day without hearing that young person's been stabbed so that is essentially county lines what um what is also associated with that is the exploitation of vulnerable people not just children so the exploitation of vulnerable adults class a drug users those with learning disabilities mental health issues the isolated, the elderly, you know, one of these findings from COVID-19 is that previously, traditionally, we did believe that it was just really stereotypical victims that were becoming involved. So, you know, you're really disenfranchised, you're traumatised. Again, people with mental health and learning disabilities. What we are finding is that it's absolutely anybody that is being victimised and exploited, and it's really all about vulnerability. So they're targeting people who are just vulnerable? Yeah, yeah, it's not even age isn't even a a huge factor. I mean, of course, children are are vulnerable by virtue of their age. Sure. But you have some children that are, you know, they've got a lot of agency, they're very clever. You have some children who are, um, you know, even even adults who are more vulnerable than some children. So it's all about vulnerability. And that impact of schools closing was a big, I can imagine that is a big problem. Like if you've got millions of school kids that are off school and not don't have a place to go to during the daytime during between you know half eight and half three then there's just potential there for yeah absolutely and and you know they've moved to social media for entertainment purposes for uh, educational purposes you know the whole country has really gone more online and with that you know it's it, it's absolutely incredible for these organized networks for perpetrators more children online, more ways to groom. You don't even need to be face to face. They just have to in- infiltrate these platforms, befriend, groom, and it's very, very simple, which I'm sure we'll come on to in a second. So I guess the really simplistic answer, which I think I already know the answer to, is COVID happens, the whole world comes to a halt, or at least it, it felt like it did. Did people stop dealing drugs? No. <laughs> no, they did not. <laughs> No. And people so, didn't stop taking them either. No, they didn't. So the nature, I mean, I've just discussed the nature of county lines is heroin and crack cocaine, right? So, you know, there's a chemical hook there. So the d- demand, regardless of what's happening in the environment, the, in- the demand has not decreased. Um, drug supply networks being what they are, ingenious, always tend to be one step ahead. they will always find a way to get the drugs to those customers. And that's exactly what's happened over COVID. And prices as well, stayed gone up a little bit. Yeah, well, varying responses, really, from the people that we spoke to. So some areas in the country reported an increase in price. Um, Again, some areas didn't. Those areas that didn't report an increase in price, what they did see was uh, a decrease in purity. Yeah, so what we did have was an increase in new adulterants being used. So, for example, there were reports that cat litter was being used to uh, bash heroin. Fuck. Cat litter? Yeah. It's brown, it's the same sort of consistency, texture. If it can be made to look like heroin, then it'll be used. And yeah, that was in one area that we found it was um, heroin. So yeah, the price did increase in some areas, it didn't in the others, but yeah, purity was um, found to decrease a little bit in those areas. Mm. It's funny, isn't it? Like the hard drugs like crack and heroin, like I can imagine they pretty much stay the same, but then like cocaine, which is normally a party drug to some extent, you'd expect people aren't going to nightclubs, people aren't going to bars, restaurants. So are people then just doing that at home when they're after 10 pints 
sat in their kitchen or like, do you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't seem... Yeah, so I would have expected to have seen, um, and again, it might have done it, it's just that this isn't our real real area of research. Yeah, yeah. I would expect to see the, the real party seeing drugs, like ecstasy and cocaine to decrease. Um, but certainly crack cocaine and heroin, you know, there was no reduction in supply, there was no reduction in demand. Um, people were still getting what they needed through any means necessary. So essentially all, a lot of, I mean, I've looked through the research as well and obviously we go through it, some of it's crazy. Essentially, all that's happened is the criminals have adapted. Yeah. Essentially, yeah. yeah, that is it. Just yeah, and they do. They'll uh, they'll adapt to different policing tactics to different market demands. Yeah, just because the world shuts down, they're not going to go. Whoa, wait a second. We need to, we need to uh, hold hold everything here. They just continue pumping it out, abusing, using children, which is. I've said I said it to you before. I think I said it to you last time. I, I, I just doesn't even fathom in my mind if I was some drug kingpin to to exploit your like it doesn't but maybe it could yeah end. if you're at the very top you're not thinking of the like the what's going on on the ground level mm. are you really those interactions i mean so here one of the key findings you've said is that the diminished face-to-face -face contact between youth workers and children continue to challenge professionals ability to identify signs of exploitation so what you're saying from that is whether that's school teachers youth workers or those kind of first early steps because of lockdown that's completely gone. Yeah, so there's been a, a huge impact on criminal justice, criminal justice system. So um, youth workers, obviously everything went to telephone contact. Now, if you're a very, really vulnerable young person, um, telephone contact might not be sufficient for you. Now, we did have some reports that some children fared better over telephone. You know, they were more comfortable making disclosures. They were actually engagement increased and we did find that engagement increased, um, but one of the the key things with that is that for those children who did pick up the phone it didn't necessarily mean that there was no exploitation that they weren't in dangerous situations so some of these practitioners that we spoke to in youth offending teams for example reported that um breaches of court orders were at an, an all-time low specifically in merseyside engagement was an all-time high children were basically paying lip service when they were answering the phone um, and as well, because they were answering the phone, there was, I think a lot of the time when you are on the phone, you have this need to fill uncomfortable silences, which is, you know, contrary to what you would do if you're in person with a young person. Um, yeah, it's a good point, yeah. It's like that thing off um, Wolf of Wall Street, you know, where he's doing the sales pitch. Yeah. And he just and says, like, hold it. Hold it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what, as in the youth workers are speaking first, they're filling those silences, as in... I think there's just a more of a, a desire to fill those silences. And children, because, you know, for whatever reason, they could say, oh, I've got to go because of this. And you couldn't physically keep them on the phone. Yeah. So those meetings that are supposed to be an hour, which perhaps aren't sufficient enough anyway, had then been dramatically reduced maybe to half an hour. Um, another, you know issue with with telephone contact was practitioners that rely on non-verbal cues when they're sitting in front of a young person uh, say for example you've got a young person that's come in with a new watch or a new trainers a new coat clothes um, maybe the smell of cannabis you know all of those signs that you could look at to identify exploitation have gone mm. um yeah body language you know I've, I've got quite a good relationship with a youth worker at um a youth offending team in merseyside and she said that she can instantly tell what mood a young person is in from walking through the door. Mm. Of course, that's gone now. Because it's all over telephone. Because it's all over telephone, yeah. So while engagement has been good, it doesn't negate the fact that children are still in dangerous situations. And how do these young people, how, how, how the hell does someone who's 13, 14 fall into this? trap of or how do they get picked up are they like is it just through social media and that's a big thing or is it just through hanging around the wrong people or i think the vast majority and again i, I did say at the start that one thing we are seeing is that anybody can be drawn into this but you know if we talk about the vast majority of young people that do find themselves in this environment it's generational they've grown up um, where they walk outside of their house and there is violence they're living in really deprived neighborhoods so you can walk down the street and there's you know there's boarded up windows there's violence on every corner um you know if you turn left out of out of your house there's a gang in in that road and if you turn right there's a gang in that road mm. a lot of the children it's it's a natural progression through street life 
Um, you know, say for example, they've, they've had issues within the home, and I'm being very stereotypical now, and I will come on to some of the cases where that's not the case at all. But, you know, they're having issues at home, maybe domestic violence, um, maybe there's some neglect there, you know, a whole host of, of issues, and then they'll go to school, and because of what's going on at home, they find it very difficult to concentrate. They display behaviour that isn't consistent with what the educational system wants to see. Uh, they find themselves being taken out of the classroom. They find themselves then excluded. And, you know, ch the children just being failed at every opportunity, learning that rejection is something that is normal for them. Mm. And then, of course, they're, they're out on the streets and they come across other people who have been through the same sort of thing as themselves who say, you know, come with us, we'll look after you, we'll do this for you. Um, and it's just, it's just a natural progression. And the exploitation really starts in the home environment and, and follows them. And then, of course, they're in those gang situations. They become normalised to the violence. They become desensitised to the things that they are doing and just really easily find themselves in a situation where they are being coerced, being groomed, being forced to work in different places. And once they are involved, it's very, very difficult for them to remove themselves. It's sad, isn't it? Because there's not one thing. It's like, it's just a little series of mini... Events. Of mini events that probably aren't even your fault if your mum and dad are out working or whatever and you've got, you're feeling lonely or whatever, and whatever's going on at home. Again, just those little series of mini events. And then before you know it, like, that happened when, me, when I was in school, you know what I mean? You get sent out, I'd be on the yellow card, then I'd go on the red card, and then my dad's coming up to school. And Did you have a card system or a yellow card? Did you? Well, after my mum passed away, I, I remember going, like, a bit rebellious for a little bit, because it was a bit like, f you know, fuck this, and I was having to sleep in my nan's, and I then get... That. So, going from living, living in home with my mum and my dad walking to school, I was then... When my dad went back to work, he was a fireman, so he'd he done two <laughs> nights a week of the week in my nan... In, in, Obviously in work, so I had to stay in my nan's. So I then had to get the bus to school, and it was all different. And I thought I just couldn't really be bothered with things. And then my attitude had changed towards some teachers. And then I got put on this yellow card. And then at the start of the lesson, you had to hand your card in. And then you had to make sure you're all right. And if you had a bad lesson, you'd write, you know, he was naughty. You'd done that card. And at the end of the day, and then if you got so many bad comments, you got on put on the red card. And then your parents, well, my dad would get rang up, and then my dad would have a go at me. And then, I mean, thankfully. That's where mine kind of ended, my rebellious streak. <laughs> but I mean, it wouldn't have been much further for me then to get expelled or excluded. And then no, of course. You don't know, you, do you? Yeah, yeah. I'm so lucky that you've got that support network from your dad. Mm. But it's so important to remember that these children, a lot of them haven't got that. Mm. Do you, my, through someone, through family member who works in in sort of social work sort of side of things, she she told me in a, an example of there was a kid that... that um, who was, I think, 16 or 15 or 16 years old. And he found he found his mum. Um, she had a heroin overdose, found his mum, moved in with the gran. The gran had a heroin addiction. And, like, how the hell do you help someone who's 15, mm. 16 to get out of that, like, institutional yeah. um, drug addiction and just, like, you know, sad enough some 14, 15 finding the mum you know, overdose and heroin dead on the kitchen floor. And then to move then with your grandma, who's also got heroin addiction, which is insane in itself. It's just like an endless cycle of... Yeah, of trauma. An, of tra yeah, of yeah. trauma. Yeah, 100%, yeah. Trauma, yeah. And it's like, there, there is literally no way out for that. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, so, it's so sad, isn't it? The way that you're literally just drawn a card when you're born. Yeah. And like a look, if, if we're all lucky, genuinely we are, we are really lucky being born in the UK. But then you just handed different cards throughout your childhood and you've got no control over them whatsoever. Yeah. And it's just fucking so sad. It really is. Yeah. And I mean, I think we, we hugely underestimate the impact of trauma, uh, specifically in, in childhood and adolescence. You know, those who have experienced trauma are much more likely to have committed a criminal offence, to go to prison, to engage in health harm related behaviours, substance misuse, um, even develop conditions like type 2 diabetes and heart disease from trauma. Really? Yeah. Through like stress and all... Yeah, every, all... the whole package, yeah. Undealt with, um, of course, if it's not addressed and then it plays out in complex behaviours when you're in school. Again, people generally don't understand um, the signs and indicators of stress, of 
um, exploitation of trauma and it just comes across as really confrontational mm. you know even um, in some of the expert witness work that I, I have done will come across police reports where they will say well this young person could have told me you know he was being exploited at any point you know why was he so aggressive when he was being arrested why was he saying no comment why was he being like this why was he aggressive well you know if you've if all you've been exposed to of authority figures is rejection and um, confrontation and a belief that nobody's going to support you and protect you, then of course that's going to be your response. Yeah, you're not going to be like that. Oh, by the way, guess what? I need to tell you this: when everyone you've ever told anything to have either, either let you down or or shown you violence, mm. yeah, what's the police expect in that sense? What do you, what's you, what do you have? What's your opinion on them on the police? Some amazing police officers and some who are just doing a job some who um you know it is it is really interesting the the nottingham research that we've been doing we've spoken to some amazing police officers and now within a lot of police forces they have specific exploitation units and you find that those police that work in them units are incredible at what they do you know they really understand they get it they understand what children are going through and they want to help and support that's amazing and we've had so many police saying that there are shifting attitudes now towards um towards victims, towards children that are involved in drug supply, great. Then I'll do some of the expert witness work and I come across police reports like that and it's just such a disconnect um, in terms of what what I'm being told in one respect and then the reality of what happens in the actual criminal justice system. Mm. So it's a mixed bag really, amazing police officers on one hand and then some who I get the impression that they don't really understand or they don't care and they just want to lock people up. Mm. Of course, that's their job, so they're in a difficult situation and that's what they've got to do primarily. Yeah, because they're not social workers, are they? They're so? not, they're not mm. social workers. And, and the police will rightly say that they're probably not the best fit to deal with criminal exploitation. Yeah, I think it is. They are in a difficult position where if, if you're dealing with criminals, or alleged criminals all the time, and for every young person, if you like, that comes in, that's been dealing drugs, to maybe look at them with your hat on and kind of maybe think, well, actually, they might be exploited if you'd done that with all of them. Yeah, of course. It would be, it would be difficult, yeah. to be fair. Yeah. I always think as well, like, I get the feeling with, with the question that how you answered it then from Tom, is if someone's passionate about county lines and is like, right, that's it, in this police force, in, you know, in this police station in Liverpool, this is what we're going to focus on, da da da. And then I get a promotion or I retire or I move on. And then the next like, guy comes along. If he's not dead passionate about it, he could be passionate about bloody gun crime, drink driving, yeah, or something, or, yeah. and it loses that yeah. kind of. Yeah, there's no real long term approach, I don't think, mm. with a lot of it, yeah. But yeah, they are in a difficult situation. It's really easy for me to sit here and say what I just have. And again, you know, if you're dealing with all these young people all the time and all they are doing is hurling abuse at you, then, you know, it's very difficult to try and empathise and yeah. have that compassionate approach. And all these. And then, again, apologies if I'm asking a stupid question here, Grace, but is your research, has it been more aimed at children, at kids, and the impacts relating to them versus county lines people maybe my age, 28 years old, and I'm shifting drugs from, I don't know, Liverpool to Manchester or whatever whatever that might look like? Yeah, so, I mean, we've, we've broadly been interested in how county lines has been impacted and exactly who has been impacted by that. We have obviously got a focus on children and young people because they are um, commonly exploited into this. But again, yeah, we are interested in the whole of the supply model, the business model, and, and how that's impacted by COVID-19. Mm. And what about people like who oh, are wait, not- Sorry, on that gone. question, what you asked is, <laughs> this is mad. I don't know why I'm laughing, but adults are more willing to get involved in drug dealing because they're not getting enough furlough money or any furlough money at all and the bills still have to be paid so on that That's question a good what point, you asked, yeah so you're seeing people getting involved in it willingly just because it's yeah, a you are, yeah. yeah okay yeah so there's an increase in in other types of backgrounds demographics of people that are getting involved in it it's really anybody it really is and what so adults are coming into it thinking i'll make a few quid and not realizing the kinds of they are and then becoming exploited and manipulated yeah, so it might not be that they are actually handing over drugs to a customer. It might be that they are allowing somebody to have a cannabis grow in their house, for example. 
or maybe they are um, one of the things that we we have come across quite a lot is an increase in the exploitation of taxi drivers. Now, of mm. course, if you're the only person that's legitimately allowed to be on the road, as taxi drivers were, Uber, I um, can't remember who else it mentions in there, but yeah, so they were obviously allowed to be on the roads and because of that, a lot of those taxi drivers were drawn in, you know, people in the back of the taxi saying, oh, just take us here, just do this for us, we'll give you a little bit of this. And of course, everyone's in a, a lot of people are in a precarious situation during COVID-19, it becomes very attractive, it becomes very easy, they think that they might not get caught. Um, well, that's the easy it's just it's a weird, isn't it? it? I didn't realise about that, taxi driver, it's interesting that, isn't it? Them flirting about everywhere. Well, and you imagine perfect, when really, lockdown was at its height and no one was allowed to go out. Taxi drivers were, weren't they? Yeah. Mm. Picking up, dropping off. So how have been people been moving drugs then? Um. So at the very start of lockdown, when we were speaking to British Transport Police, now the, the rail network's always been really common for sending drugs and moving children. Um, because there was there was a huge decrease in in foot traffic on the rail network british transport police were able to spot young people that were passing through and interestingly you know they did they're ingenious really and perpetrators were telling young people to wear disguises one of the most common disguises was a builder's uniform a high vis you know if, if you put high vis no on one questions somebody, a high vis <laughs> right oh. so they were having children in these but well i say children young adults young people yeah, not like tw- no, like no, twelve no, year old no. in a high vis in a tool bag. No, I'll come on to the twelve year olds in a minute. So yeah, these um these young adults that were travelling through the trip, the rail networks, wearing high vises, builders outfits, and obviously they'd they'd go through, they'd come back four, five, six hours later, and they'd still be immaculately dressed. There would be not one speck of dust <laughs> or dirt on that uniform. That's a rookie era. And of course, the police would stop them. They'd say, well, you know, why, why are you out? What's your excuse? And they would find in a lot of young people that way. Then um, we had, because of the success that they were reporting, there was a shift. There was a movement away from using the trains and onto the roads. And again, the use of taxis. We managed to speak to somebody from thrifty car and van rental company because they had seen a huge increase in the exploitation of um, people with clean driving licenses uh, exploitation of young people and during covid obviously they moved everything online like everybody else did so they moved to what they call a, a, a flexi rental which was a rolling 28 day contract and no no face-to-face contact needed to take place for that so perpetrators offenders criminal networks could go on the website and basically hire out a vehicle amazing obviously for the perpetrators because they're not seeing anybody in person but what they were doing is putting advertisements on social media sites like facebook and instagram for anything between 500 pounds and four thousand pounds for people to hand over their driving licenses and documentation and those who had clean driving licenses were offered more money Fucking just man. the documentation, not themselves having to drive no, it. Just, just, the, just, the, doc- just the documents. Just the documents. Yeah. Jesus. So there's a huge increase in ID and ID fraud and ID theft. But then what was happening there was obviously if you've handed over your documentation, not only were this network then taking out a car rental, they were taking out finance agreements, they were taking out credit cards, they were taking out loans. Oh my god. Really leaving these people in, in really bad situations. And it's very difficult for law enforcement to um, to address because, again, it's all online. It's very difficult to track down who's put that advert there. And everyone's on furlough. People are fucks with no money. So, I mean, it's, so t- it's obviously not tempting for myself, but you can see how it is tempting. If you are absolutely fucking skint, yeah. <laughs> and I don't know, someone says, look, I'll give you three grand if you let us use your driving licence. And you, you've got kids and all that. What are you going to do, yeah? You can see can, why people yeah, do it. Yeah, of course, yeah. 100%. But then the naivety and that, though, we're thinking that they're only going to use my driver's licence and nothing else. And then before you know it, they've got bloody loans and all kinds. And Yeah. They just oh liquidate the God. assets then, sell the car, take the money. Um, and that person's left in a situation where they can't have a bank account. They can't then get any more credit. might struggle to get a mortgage because of what's happened. They're obviously not going to want to tell the police exactly what maybe they do. Or they're certainly not going to say who it was. Hey, Tom Wickstead's asked me for me fucking driver's license. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, oh. and then they would then use those hire cars to then obviously move drugs about and. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, one of the the 
key aspects of County Lines is that cars will regularly be changed, passed around the network, really to just remain under the radar. Um, so yeah, while there was an increase in the use of the roads, what we did have with that was an increase in car-related injuries of young people attending A&E. Really? Um, yeah, so if there's obviously more cars on the roads, drug-related activity, there were more police chases, more car accidents. Um, actually, cars were being used as, as weapons by some networks to run young people over. Fucking hell. That so is... In a time when no one was allowed out and young people were getting behind the wheel more yeah. for, for these kind of... Oh, wow. Do you know what? I, you've just reminded me, I saw this um, during lockdown and it was... Um, it was a um, it was a it was a um, police stop that they did in um, the M6 I think it was and they were carrying nearly 200 kilos of cocaine during um, during um, the pandemic so moment police made biggest ever UK drug seizures to intercept 20 million pounds of cocaine on M6 and there was a photo i think and i think they were using a higher higher van as well they literally just ripped the bottom of the higher van out yeah put put 20 mil of um of coke in it and then and then they got caught that's one hell of a bust that isn't it 20 mil you'd be gutted one um... in there's nothing that they'll find something so a and e seen an increase in in road traffic accidents i think is mad you read on the report and you think that is mad. This is going to be even more crazy. Uh, it goes from bad to worse. The longer you read, it goes from I bad will... to worse. So it says about the A&E. Fuck me, right. Professionals are also described an increase in the instance of violence as well as the shift in type of injuries and the severity. One participant reported an increase in the number of young males aged 21, 21 and under attending A&E in the south of the country who had been the victim of rape by heterosexual males in a gang context. Yeah, huge increases in sexual violence, severity of violence. Heterosexual though? Yeah. It's a form of dominance and control, isn't it? It is so insane. If they, so if there's a young person that's done something that, you know, perceived to have disrespected the, the wider network, they are going to be punished. And, you know, what's the, the worst punishment that you can do to somebody? You're really taking away their masculinity. By doing something like that, you really exert exerting know. control and dominance over them. You know, the, because, you know, drug supply is such a huge business, there are so many different networks, they need to be the most feared. So... Yeah, it's a perpetuating cycle, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah, so the violence just gets worse and worse, more severe, more common. Yeah, Neil Wood said that, said that exact same thing. It was like... If you if you're a drug gang, if you're somebody who's in charge of a of a gang, and one of your guys gets caught, you don't want him ratting you up, so you make sure you're violent, or you've come across as violent, or you do violent acts so that you'll never get grasped or ratted on, or and it's just like mm. a perpetuating cycle where it just gets worse and worse and worse. Yeah. So it's all fear based, isn't it? And yeah. You know, it's not regulated. They can't turn to the police and say, "Oh, somebody's robbed me," or "Somebody's." Somebody's not given the drugs that, that they were supposed to to this individual. They can't do that. So the way that they control that market is through violence. And how did you find out about that then? About the So we spoke to um, youth workers from a charity that are based in the south of the country. So Birmingham and London mainly with a few workers in Nottingham. And they're an absolutely amazing organisation called... And they, um, they have youth workers attending young people um, who come into A&E with violence related injuries and they will basically visit them off the ambulance, sit with them in the in the ward, sit with them in resource if they need to, they will just hold the hand if that's all that they need them to be there for. You know, it's I cannot advocate for this kind of work more because it's such a reachable moment for that young person, you know, they're coming in, they're really physically vulnerable and you know, they, especially during COVID-19, they didn't have any friends or family at the bedside. No one was allowed in. Mm. So these A&E workers, the, the youth workers, became the only person really that was there for that child. You know what's mad as well when you hear this, and I'm about to go on, is, is, is just as horrible. But you know when, again, 
we all know people who have took drugs, you know, we may even know people who deal drugs and it's, you know, the Pablo Escobar's and looked at in a certain light and stuff like that and drug dealers are this and that and they're driving around on the flash cars and the nice watches and all that. When you come to this low level of, you know, a six, 16, 17 year old getting raped, getting stabbed in A&E, that's when you think, Fuck, this isn't right, this. Mm. And you only have to look on Netflix. There's a, yeah, yeah. you know, it's it's glamorized and it's hard. He's, Every he's, single other YouTube thing is an interview with a ex drug cocaine smuggler or any of that. What bullshit. happens to gangsters? You know, trying to lay low. Every gangster wants to go on a podcast <laughs> and fucking share I the know, story, don't I they? Know. And I, it's, uh, I still think serious and organized crime, individuals, criminals, still are like that. You don't hear about them. You don't hear about the people that are importing drugs into this country. They do lay low and they would want nothing to do with this exploitation or violence. It's bad for business. Mm. Mm. It's, the, you know, we've just got so many disenfranchised, disenfranchised young people who are wanting to make a name for themselves, mm. who, again, you know, for all those reasons that I've already discussed, haven't got very good um, employment opportunities or, you know, live chances. You know, if, if, if drug supplies on your doorstep, you, that's what you're going to do, isn't it? If you've not given, been given any other chances. So there are so many young people like that. And I think that's why we've got such a volume of these street gangs, which are completely separate to organized crime gangs. And I would actually say that I think a lot of the council lines activity isn't organized crime. Of course, it centers around drug supply and it does touch on other aspects, you know, fraud, money laundering, but the, the the children that we hear about, the <laughs> council lines model itself, I don't think is very organised. Right. Because they don't want any part any, any part to do with it. No, organised criminals wouldn't. No. The, the, the too high up or the two above. They're very, very intelligent people. They, they make the money and then they move out of the area that they're from. They use that money to then open up legitimate businesses, to send the kids to private schools, to have the best life. You don't hear about them. Hmm. On, Except on, on a YouTube, uh, <laughs> yeah. when they when they get caught, then they go on a YouTube yeah. uh, interview. But even that, though, you know, these there's so many podcasts now everywhere you look. There's a you know ex criminal talking about what he done and what he got away with. None of them talk about this, do they? About the you know the proper yeah the harm that's done. Yeah, I know it wouldn't. I mean, it wouldn't. Uh, yeah, you know, mental health is such a big thing at the moment. Going going on from 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 young lads being raped. How, how long does it take to come out? You know, how long did it take for the Jimmy Savile stuff to come out? People to come forward to say they've been raped or who's the that, that football coach as well? he come out and the people who've been on SAS who days wins, there was a guy, wasn't it? Yeah. Who'd come out, um, he'd been raped by a football coach. It takes years to come out, you know, the mental health issue <clears throat> today, so... If it does. If it does yeah, ever yeah, come out, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, it says fingernails pulled out here, pulled out, even the stabbings. Whereas before COVID-19, you might might have seen one or two injuries as a younger person. They will now be repeatedly stabbed. So we're talking five or six times. Um, and participants also observed an increase in self-harm and suicide attempts. Now, from what we've read, if you're getting, if you've been raped or gang raped and people have, have got that over you, obviously suicide's gonna be a viable option. Yeah, yeah. These, the, you know, some of the, the cases I've worked on would keep you up at night. Um, children that feel so trapped that they feel like the only way out is to end their own life. You know, I've worked on cases where children have been so desperate to, to remove themselves from the network that when they have been arrested and then they've been sent to court, they've stood in front of the judge and asked to be put on an electronic monitor, on a tag, because that would provide them with a legitimate reason for having to stay in their house and right. not going to meet this person who's exploiting them and forcing them to sell drugs. Because, you know, ch children can say, or they can try and stay in the house and try and escape it. But the perpetrators will constantly ring them. They will send people to park the cars outside the houses. They'll send people to knock on the door just to have that intimidating presence. Well, it, it, exactly that. And it's it's the um, the blackmail as well. Like, you know, pictures of, you know, indecent images of maybe the video of the rape are getting used as, you know, blackmail for it. Yeah, so this is quite alarming, really. Obviously, we've got more children using social media as a form of entertainment. And yeah, um, networks coercing young people into taking explicit images of themselves to obviously have that image and use it as a 
a form of control, something to hang over the head to say, you know, if you don't comply with us, then this is going to get released to maybe school or your parents or really the people that you don't want it to be released to. And it's not just young females either. It's young males. Madness, isn't it? That I did not exp- Fuck me. There is a lot of heavy stuff in this report, Grace, I'll be there completely is. honest. There I is. mean, one of the things which... Uh, I don't mean to joke about it, but... Um, it said adaptations to drug supply methods and people, it says here, um, in one part of England, police documented inconspicuous methods of transport, including the use of canal barges to traffic yeah. drugs along waterways. Tom is smiling because we've got a little plan to go on Tom's <laughs> boat on the canal. I've seen the speed that canal barges move and it ain't quick. So I don't know how they're moving drugs, but fair enough. But would you look at a canal boat and think that might have drugs on it? No, no, it, it's a good it's point. It's just anything, it's risk mitigation, it's anything that they can use to remain under the radar and get drugs from A to B, and, you know, they're ingenious. If there's some, you know, as well as the canal barges, there was drones that were being used as well. So next time you're on the canal and you see Mary and Stephen, eight, 70 years old, on the on a canal barge, just be a little bit cautious. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what they've got in that barge. <laughs> Do you know, um, like you say, some of these horrors that are going on, it is one of those things where whether you, whatever your reason for coming in, for getting involved in county lands, whether that's for money, whether that's family, all the things we've already mentioned, what's becoming clear is once you're in, you're in. Yeah. So one of the things here, it says about, um, there was a guy in A&E who'd been heavily involved in county lands and he was in hospital that night for trying to drink a litre of bleach, saying that he just wanted to get out because this particular day they were gang raping someone. So they weren't even gang raping him but he refused to get involved. So they beat him and now they were after him. Yeah, so this particular young person was being forced to engage in the rape of another young person. And because he wouldn't get involved in that and basically went home and left the group, they were then threatening to kill him. Oh my God. It's insane, isn't it? They, they just had like, where is this fucking happening? Do you know what I mean? It's yeah, like, where, where, is, where is this happening? Everywhere, everywhere. And I think, you know, one of, one of the really important things to get across from this is that we have got such a focus on county lines, which is fantastic because the harm it imposes on society and communities is huge. But that focus tends to overlook exploitation in our own neighborhoods, which is happening a lot more you know, it's day to day. For example, when I was doing my PhD research in Merseyside, County Lines had only, um, the first sort of mention of County Lines was 2015 in a National Crime Agency report. And I started the research in 2016. And out of the 18 children and young people that I spoke to, only a handful, maybe four or five of those, had actually had experience of working in different areas. But they were all being exploited locally into drug supply or theft, robbery, breaking into cars, vandalism, things like that. So while it's amazing that we do have this focus and there is all this resources that are, that are being um, put into addressing it, you know, exploitation is happening everywhere mm. on your doorstep. And I guess COVID has just amplified that in all. Oh, COVID has provided perpetrators with a perfect storm for exploitation and grooming. Which is weird, you know, because if you'd have asked me there's going to be a pandemic and what do you think drug- things going to happen to drug supply? And I just said, well, if everyone can't go out, then like surely things are going to grind to a halt with it. But no, sadly not. Sadly not. No. Through social media, through, I mean, obviously one, when everything start, started to open up. But then we, we had the chief executive, Merseyside, ex-chief executive, Merseyside Police, and he said, well... If people are dealing drugs, it's obviously illegal. And if the government say to stay at home and you don't, it's obviously illegal. So you're not going to listen to them. You see what I mean? Mm. You're already selling drugs. So you're not going to fucking care about staying yeah, at home. or made it a little bit more difficult. Yeah. More barriers to overcome. But yeah, it wasn't impacted really. Be- if I just... Do you, do you mind if I go through this? Yeah, yeah, go, 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 And go. then at the end, I want to try and get, you, get your thoughts on drugs as a whole. But this is getting fucking... So now we're on to females... And in addition, one youth worker referred to the use of gift girls, describing the sexual exploitation of females by county lines. What? What's this? Gift girls, essentially, where, for example, a young person might have proved themselves as a competent drug dealer. So maybe they've 
sold all the drugs that they were given, they've excelled, they've come back with um, the money, there's been no issues, there's been no losses <laughs> of money, um, nothing's gone missing. You know, they have done something worthy of reward, perhaps. And then young females who are being sexually exploited are being passed around the network as a reward for these young people. That's horrific, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And what ages are these people in? What ages are these girls or, like... Um, I wouldn't have that... I haven't got that information, really. You know, I, my view would be that it would probably be around 16, 17, 18-year-old girls. And, you know, the sexual violence that they are experiencing has become more severe as well. You know, the injuries that they, they are attending A&E with are much more severe. All because of, a, like, yeah, that's horrific, that, isn't that? That's something yeah. out of fucking ISIS, like, serious sort of stuff, isn't it? Where... You know what? I, I, I seen something the other day and I thought that, you know, the way in Liverpool, I guess, the UK... To young people, drug dealers and that kind of thing has got this kind of glamorous look like we just mentioned. But when you read this, what they're doing, those same people would look at the drug dealers and the cars and the Rolex and all that and think, wow, I want to be like him. And they look at the Middle East and Afghan and think, oh, they're fucking living in the dark ages. <laughs> yeah. When I was in Afghan, right, the fellas were raping the other vulnerable little soldiers and stuff like that. I, that was going on in Afghan. Yeah, this is what's going on now in the UK. And it's getting glamorised with yeah. drugs and nice cars and watches where actually they're just as bad as what's going on in the Middle East. Yeah, 100%, yeah. And it's difficult because there's money involved and there's cash involved. People, kids are wearing nice clothes, Montclair jackets, where they're getting them from. And, you know, if I was a kid and I saw someone like, oh, where did you get that from? How did you get that? Do you know what I mean? It's so tempting, isn't yeah. it? So their education is people that they see on the street who have come from the exact same background that they have and have managed to get some money out of it or, you know, change their life. Their education is not school. Their education is other individuals like them who are mm. successful in, in drug supply. Well, on that note then, not to kind of say that your work is going unnoticed, but I'm guessing the education would be the type of work you're doing, which is then policy, which is then going to governments with your ideas... Is enough being done by the government when when you come with your colleagues and you know you've put you've put at the end you know things that you sh we should you know kind of your recommendations are the government just not listening to these recommendations or is it the police I mean what's you guys have done all this research you've found out what's going on you've give this to the government I'm guessing we hope it gets there we haven't you know it's there it's publicly available um, we make these policy recommendations for the people who change policy and make policy can read them. You can obviously lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. I'd be fucking posting this at number 10 and saying, <laughs> listen, BJ, you need to bloody read this. Yeah. But no, you know, they've put so much resource into policing county lines, which is great, but policing it isn't going to change it and isn't going to really help the people that get involved. It's not going to, it's not going to change that vulnerability. It's not going to change the reason why people become involved. You know, what about the the charities that are working with these vulnerable people? What money are they are they receiving? Yeah, the um, charity sector will have been shot, won't it, yeah. to bits yeah. during you know, COVID? Yeah, people Local can't. authority budgets have shrunk massively. Um, youth offending teams in Merseyside have been cut in half. Youth centres and stuff like that. Recently, yeah. Youth centres have been closed. Uh, you know, children haven't got anything to do or anywhere to go. So what else is there for them? So while they've put so much money into policing, which is great because they want to look like they're tough on crime, there are so many other sectors that are struggling and um, haven't got the resources that they need. So your answer is to send, give these charities more money to help? Because it's like at the back, it's like at the end of the cycle when they're in that ambulance, but it's, ca but it's trying to rewind that, that time all the way back to that point where... They start yeah, that think... conversation with that kid in that park who is also is dealing drugs and then that's when something needs to happen there. Or does it need to go further back? Well, or by funding it... the... I mean, you might correct, you're the expert on it, but by just funding the police, what you're saying, it's almost too late there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You need to be funding it from an even earlier level. Way back, way back when. And then have... I'm sure we'll talk about your views on drug policy and how that could pos possibly have yeah. the whole thing eradicated somewhat. Yeah, it needs to start. I mean, 
families need help. It needs to start from birth. I mean, yeah, once you've got a child in a youth offending team, you know, ultimately they're probably 14, 15. That behaviour is ingrained, it's entrenched. They've already experienced so much trauma. Mm. Um, and, and yeah, the, the funding is not there. You know, mental health services have been faced, been on over the phone, sorry, for the past 12 months. And children were waiting something like 12 months to even be seen. Yeah. Prior to COVID-19, I wouldn't even want to imagine what the waiting list is now. I seen a Joe Rogan podcast recently with a guy and he said that, he said if there's a business to invest into, it would be online, basically face-to-face -face, um, counsellors. Like, don't be long until a company will start and it'll be a, a, just a FaceTime with a counsellor, someone to speak to over mental health, because that's just going to explode. And... <laughs> Really yeah, I mean, ev everyone's like you said it yourself during COVID nineteen. You know, your head was popped a few I days. I hated it, mate. Yeah. So, like, imagine being in a household at mm -hmm. thirteen, fourteen years old, and your parents aren't at work, you're not at school, you can't fucking see your friends, or you're in care, or you're in care. Sorry, yeah. And you're not even with the people that you want to be with. Yeah, it is mayhem, isn't it? And we we said you know in the car before, Andy, like we're sixteen months into this now, aren't we? And you've obviously seen this this report here and what is included in it is obviously at the forefront of what's happened over the past 16 months. But that yeah. fallout will last, you know, decades, decades, yeah. even, maybe even generations. Or don't think we have really seen the. I mean, we've definitely not really seen the impacts economically, um, financially. You know, we had deindustrialization in the 70s, 80s. I get the dates mixed up. And many families obviously engaged in blue collar work in the industry. Now take that work away. And a lot of these individuals didn't have that form of work. So the alternative, you know, it's been replaced by drug supply. And that was going back to the eighties. And you know, the reason why um, we've got generational crime families now is because they've learned from members mm. of the family that, you know, the only way to prosper and succeed is through drug supply. Now, if we have all the issues that we've had now with COVID, there's going to be huge unemployment. There are already mental health issues, really severe mental health issues that are unaddressed, that are only getting worse. Isolation, for example, people in precarious situations before that will be even more precarious situations now. All of these vulnerabilities, I think, are only going to get worse. You know, children that have been excluded from school, children who have really struggled to get back into the educational routine and the tolerance for that negative complex behavior has decreased amongst staff mm. more children becoming um, excluded more vulnerable children you know more just a <laughs> recipe for disaster in, yeah, yeah. Um, what was we saw something didn't we with andy cook was it 14 or 15 kids per day are excluded from school 42 children, an average Sorry. of 42 children per day were excluded from school in 2019. I can't but, even get me yeah, that yeah. is mad. Sorry, yeah, I got my stats were way off. But. 42 a day. Like 42 <laughs> yeah. children a day. That's a class size, a, a, a class day, and a half yeah. maybe. Yeah. yeah. Every day. I, every school. Where, like, yeah, where, I was going to say, where are the kids going? Yeah, where do they? We know, well, a lot of them, no doubt, yeah. are getting involved in this kind of stuff. What Madness, it, you know? It? What's the key with that then? Would would just be to, I know it's very. If any teachers listen, they're thinking I can't just keep them in the class, but mm. there's got to be something else then. Surely, then excluding them. Yeah. So include them is the opposite of exclusion, yeah. isn't it? Include them. So um, I've recently been going into a school in uh, Sefton, and they have created an on-site inclusion unit for children with these complex behaviours. So previously, children that would have been excluded are now being sent to these inclusion units within the school. They've got dedicated staff who are specialists in their um, field and their expertise who actually, you can tell that they're really passionate about what they do and obviously the child can see that. And then they focus on morals and behaviours. So really addressing some of the, the issues or the shortfallings of that young person's behaviour. And then they've got counsellors who will really address, you know, where that behaviour is coming from. And it, even the language of inclusion unit as opposed to exclusion unit, mm. you know, children that aren't being written off, children that 
than actually are being given a chance. So there are amazing things that are happening and we've also got quite a lot of diversionary um, schemes taking place in the country at the minute. One of course that's to tackle the, the court backlog and the issues of the numbers of children going through the criminal justice system and the other is to give young people a chance. So, in, so when you've got a child who's committing a really low level offence, say possession of cannabis, um, possession of a knife, instead of sending them to court straight away and giving them a criminal record, they are now being provided with support in some areas, support with um, drug and alcohol use, support with understanding the law and you know other things that they might need help with, mental health issues for example. And they are involved in planning their own safety, planning their own contracts. So okay. they might have to do different things on this contract, but they've agreed to it, they've consented to it, and only if they then break an aspect of that contract or don't comply with that contract will they then be sent to court. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of really good little things that are happening. I think it's just educating ourselves on what it is and mm. um, how we can help children and young people. Is that a common practice for schools to be having these inclusion units, or is it that? Is that the minority at the moment? I think it's a minority. I've heard a few schools, but not not many. Um, the, the, you know, the first thing to do is exclude a child, send them to a people referral unit or send them to an assessment center. Now these people referral units, in my opinion, are one of the worst places that you can send a child. You know, instead of sending children to schools with other children who've got complex behaviors, why not send them to um, a, a school that's got a really good reputation? A school that has really good morals you know these these people referral units are breeding ground for criminality they don't have um structured routine they don't have um they're not even in nine to nine till three every single day they only have half the week in those schools right it's like that thing about your surroundings isn't it yeah of you course know. it is so why not take these children and place them in environments where other children are succeeding and they can learn off that mm yeah like. yeah it's a good point it's just whether how that would actually obviously we're just talking here so we don't but you know if i was a headmaster it really and i've tried my utmost to get this school amazing and then someone says right you're having this kid who's a little johnny who's little, just been caught yeah. bringing drugs into his old school <laughs> i'd be like that's, well yeah not on my issue, watch yeah we've got rankings that obviously schools want to be high in those rankings we've got parents who necessarily wouldn't want their child to be associating with a child who's come from that background who's yeah. displaying those behaviors who might negatively impact upon their child it's a societal attitude change that we need instead of rejecting and excluding children to actually find out what's happened to them find out why they're displaying difficult behaviors well, so, some of those on that point you just made 83.3 percent of young people did not re-offend having completed that program how amazing is that so that's it's having huge success and you know so say a kid gets excluded or whatever and then let's say they're 14 15 years old right and they they're they are let's say carrying a knife right it's pretty serious carrying a knife walking around any city center with a knife would they then go to a Young Offenders Institute for carrying that knife because carrying a knife, I think, is it like five years or something like that? Like, something like, you like, mean with the diversionary scheme or in general? In general, um, they will. I don't know, it depends on a lot of different circumstances whether they've offended before, for example, if they've been involved in anything else. They would definitely go to courts for that, and then they would definitely have a statutory duty to go to the youth offending team and deal with that behavior, right? But again nothing in their environment is changing to address that behavior. Hmm. Whereas these diversionary schemes are focusing on what that young person needs to change their trajectory. Yeah, makes sense. It's crazy the, old world, it's a crazy old world we live in. Some of the um, recommendations then that you guys have done, so I'm guessing this is yourself and, and the guys in Nottingham. Yeah, so there's a team of five of us. Three of us are Based, no, four of us are based at the University of Nottingham and one found a month at the University. First of all, fair play to you because to have to go through research of everything from women getting passed around to men raping other men to the violence, the stabbings, and, well, it's, it's grim work. So, I mm. mean, the work that you guys have done is unreal to try and help them. Some of the recommendations you put, face-to-face -face meetings with young people should resume as soon as possible. 
i.e. the youth workers getting back in there and just seeing these young people again? Yeah, absolutely. Being able to identify um, any signs of exploitation, being able to identify any differences in that young person, you know, are they portraying behaviours that they weren't before? Um, just being in front of them and building trust and building a rapport and encouraging them to make a disclosure, really, because they're not going to do that over the phone mm. in most cases. An independent return home interviews should be completed in person within 48 hours. Yeah, so this relates to children that have been missing. So if you are a child and you have gone missing, I think the the procedure is to have, in normal circumstances, to have a return home interview with a professional within 48 hours. It might be 24 hours. It should be 24 hours. I use this if someone's been sent down to bloody Devon to, for a yeah, few days or yeah. something. So if they've been reported missing from home, if they've been reported missing from care, wherever that might be, it might be in a different area, it might just be with the friends they are supposed to have a return home interview. Now, because of COVID-19, these have obviously been happening over the telephone. Now, if you are a child who has gone missing and maybe you've been groomed by a network and you're in the stages where you think that this network are your friends, there is absolutely no way that you are gonna pick up the phone to somebody who you don't know and say, oh, this is what happened to me. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah, those needs to be over the telephone. Uh, Sorry, they need to be in person. As soon as possible. You'd think that they, now that this whole pandemic slowly, well, we hope anyway, coming to an end, that people are starting to do more of those interviews in person. Yeah, they are. They are. I think there's some organisations who are becoming quite complacent and and either trying to make themselves believe that they've been working these, you know, telephone contacts, and that actually it's in the best interest of the child and it's in the best interest of the staff. But really, it's, you know, it's not. We need to be face-to-face with these children. Yeah, 100%. So yeah. they are starting to, to go back to in-person contact. Yeah. And this one, um, statutory services should incorporate diversity schemes to reduce court backlogs and to keep young people out of the criminal justice system. That's hence what, what we referred to just then, yeah. yeah. So in Merseyside alone, there's 600 cases waiting to go through to the courts, 600 children and young people who are either on bail, on remand, or being released under investigation. Now, How is that? Might... A fucking 600? Yeah. Just because of the backlog? Yeah. I mean, the court system was on its arse before COVID-19. Yeah, so it's, it's yeah, even yeah. worse now because courts have been closed. But yeah, 600 people, you know, might not be guilty, will definitely probably be experiencing some sort of trauma. Victims who are waiting for their justice to be served. You know, I... I'm working on cases, sorry to interrupt, cases at the minute where the trial date has been set for 2023. <laughs> but yeah imagine you're a kid in that and you're the g- drug dealer whoever is exploiting you and is saying when you're in court you better not drop me in it you I, I swear to god i'll fucking burn your house down if you say anything that you shouldn't and you've got that hanging over you for two years yeah yeah that's a good one yeah i spoke to a young oh. person when i was doing the phd research actually and um he was serving a 18 month sentence for possession with intent to supply no sorry eight year sentence for possession with intent to supply and arson and basically what happened is he'd been exploited by this individual who had been giving him some free drugs and seeing this person in the park one day who's asked him for the money and obviously didn't have the money and this person's pulled out a knife and stabbed him He's then said, right, you're going to go and sit in this house. Now, this is where the council lines thing isn't isn't important in this because this young person was from Liverpool and he was put in the home of a drug user in Liverpool. So he wasn't sent to work anywhere else. It was yeah. literally around the corner from where he lived. He's in this house and something happens. There's an altercation with the drug users in the house and the young person. And this guy who's basically exploiting this child has come in, poured petrol all over the house and put a lighter to it. Now, luckily, the house didn't set fire. It's gone out straight away. I don't know how. And this young person basically sat in front of me. He was in a prison cell and he said, I would have taken the blame for this, even if those people in that house died. He was that scared of this person. That is insane, isn't it? So, so, yeah, you know, children are more scared of these perpetrators of these networks than they are of the police Mm. if he's willing to think of all the different people are in jail now and how many 
again, I don't know that obviously we're guessing what the percentage is, but there'll be so many people who are in jail right as we speak now who've just done that exact same thing and just decided, yeah, it's not worth the hassle. I might as well just take yeah. the blame for it. Imagine mm. yeah. how much fear you must be in. Yeah. And it's, it doesn't stop once you get to prison. Yeah. So some of these networks have people in prison who will begin exploiting people. Even something as simple as, um, you know, giving somebody some chocolate biscuits. Massive in prison, because obviously you food's crap. You've been given chocolate biscuits by this person day in, day out, and then you get released and somebody comes to your door and says, oh, you know them chocolate bis- biscuits that you've been given in prison? Well, this is what you've got to do for them. So that does not happen. It does happen. It might not be biscuits. It might be <laughs> McVitie's. It might be spice. It might be you know any other sauce after item, luxury item in prison. Doesn't take much for it to be luxury in prison. Yeah, um, of course. You know, oh. exploitation sometimes starts in these environments. The program time. Yeah, amazing. I watched the first episode. You're not finished it yet. No. Nope. Jamie McGovern time. Wow. I mean, well, that guy was getting exploited, didn't he? Sean Bean would you say when he's the guy when he um, he learns how to fight and then the guy the drug dealer has him going out and when he has to go and do that talk yeah, yeah. just ruin it all air all for oh, me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry you, you, well, I won't say I'll too much go, yeah, I don't want to say too much sorry I'll ruin it go, yeah you need to watch it but yeah, I guess then, yeah. Yeah, I've been exploited into bringing things into the prison. Yeah. It's just so, it's so naive, isn't it? When you think, oh, someone's giving you biscuits for X amount of time and then a few months later they say, oh, remember that little few biscuits to give you? Well, but I guess, yeah, like you say, when you're in prison, that's a massive deal. Mm, real luxury item, yeah. I've only seen the first episode, so I did think it was a little, I'll be honest, I did think it was a little bit slow. I'm like, come on, get something. Oh, but, tell me you need to stick with it. Yeah. How many episodes is it? Three? Three. Three. In- Stephen Graham pulls out of the bag, doesn't he? Each and every Always. time. We've got um, James Joyce Nelson coming on the pod soon as well, so you need to watch it. He was one of the actors in it. I tell you, I tell you who who was an extra in it. Uh, Dean Fagan and John May as well. Was he? Yeah, he was the. Well, you might not have seen. I don't want to say. It was <laughs> <laughs> really an extra in yeah. it. Yeah. Who, who did you say? Do you- Dean. Fe- Do you remember um, Tisha, Mary, and um, Dean who went to their? Oh yeah. He, he was he was he was an extra. Of Coronation Street. Of Cor- yeah. Coronation Street. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was the most realistic thing I have ever seen, the most realistic portrayal of prisons I have ever seen in anything that I've ever watched. It was brilliant. Really yeah. difficult watch, but brilliant. Really difficult, and it, and it shows just the the wide range of people who are in. You know, Sean Bean character, someone who, you know, seemed like a nice guy, teacher, made a bad mistake. You know, he's, he's had a drink and he's drove home. He's killed someone. Obviously, an awful thing to do, but on the whole, seemed like you know an, a nice guy. He's just made an awful mistake, and yet he's in there with that, in that kind of then, that fishbowl of them potentially being exploited. And you see all, and again, it comes back to exactly what you say. It's just a few little things, yeah. And then before you know it, you're just like, well, what do I do now? Hmm. There's I, no way out. Yeah. I might not be well liked for saying this, but the prison population is made up of nice guys and women who have been severely traumatised, who have experienced things that I couldn't imagine. Of course, there are people in prison that deserve to be in prison, but there are so many people in prison, non-violent people, um, people who have just made a wrong turn, people who have been exploited. You know, you walk down the prison system, it is a a ground for the most... Traumatised people, I know I've said trauma so much in this, but it really is. And it's really easy as a society to have that view of us and them. Mm. Well, this would never happen to me, or I would never do that. But you don't know, and it's yeah. you, you one step away from something like that sometimes. Oh, yeah. 100%, I can 100% say I was definitely of that of that ilk to be like, oh, you've been in prison, oh, you've come back over it. And it's only as you get maybe a bit older, you know, you speak to yourself and you can have these long, in-depth conversations and you realise, you know, that that Sean being that character, that could have been my dad, you know. His wife's died, he's got three kids coming home, he goes for a drink after work, <clears> he has probably three or four drinks, and he thinks, fuck it, I'll drive home. He drives home, it's someone. Now, my dad, you know, he's a good guy, he's a firefighter. He's, you know, but, yeah. but he's, his wife's just died, he's pissed off with the world, he's had a couple more drinks than he should have before, you know it. That's him in prison. Mm. Is he now one of those scumbags that I thought so before? It's just stories like that where oh, I think yeah. when you get a bit older and you realise that and all the examples you've given about, you know, just 
people being born into maybe poor mm. families or born into crime or but it's, we have to have somewhere to put people we have to have some deterrence don't we we have to have some and you could argue that prison isn't a deterrent because there are people there and clearly it hasn't deterred them but like for pe- for that guy who drunk drive and killed someone there has to be somewhere doesn't there to there has to be prisons there has to or does that i don't know it's a rhetorical question yeah, but I, i'm not i'm not against prisons at all and and absolutely there are there are certain people who the only place for them is prison and of course prison is really to protect the wider public Mm. so if somebody is causing significant harm to members of the public then yes they deserve prison but one of the things that prison is supposed to do is rehabilitate and it's not at all so i mean we've got some a reoffending rate of something like it might be as high as 60 70 percent in the first 12 really once someone's left prison yeah in the first 12 months 60 70 percent yeah i'm not 100 percent sure there might do me to... It might come up quite fast if you type that in. Um, because... It's getting quite cocky now, telling you to Google. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pull this up, Tom, right now for me. Um, reoffending rates. Reoffending. Re... Well, on that, on that note of prisons, and you go down a bit like the conspiracy, not conspiracy, but a bit like, oh, the politicians and stuff. On that time, one of the lines, thinking it was each prisoner cost, I think, 30 odd grand. Yeah, it's about £36,000 a year. That is... <laughs> it's mad, though, isn't it? Now, how much... Would it be to send them to university for three years would be less than that. And I'm not saying that we should start sending all these people to university, but... No, not you mean, so though, yeah. For so many young people, for so many people who are in prison for drug-related offences, that might be... Um, they've got addictions themselves and that's landed them in prison. If we provided them with the support that mm. they needed, in the long run, that would be so much cheaper... So yeah. much cheaper. There's got to be something better to be doing than putting people in who, you know, have made a bad mistake. Of course, they have the cost of guilty in that sense, but 36 grand a year, it's all that time wasted. And it, there's got to be, I don't know what it is, whether it is, you know, some sort of uni course or whatever. There's got to be something else because it, at that 60, 70% rate, it's it's yeah. not working, is it? It is wasted because nothing changes. The behaviour isn't getting addressed. The The way that the prison system is at the minute with overcrowding, with a staff shortage, there aren't the resources in prison to help people change that behaviour. So really, you are just housing people really expensive for whatever length of time that sentence is and then releasing them into an environment that you know is negative for them that nothing's changed Mm. so why would you expect a different outcome no no there is um there's so many different figures here there's quarterly rates there's like um on that last slide i'm sure i saw yeah i think yeah it said is they're high anyway they're really high I think, see, that top number there, that 34, that's on ethnicity, I think, because it was... Uh, young offenders as well, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I've seen something it said, like... Re-offending rate of... Yeah, 62%. Yeah, I think it's around that. It's mad, that, isn't it? And that do you know what? Mad. This that's um, something that you just wouldn't think. Well, I wouldn't have thought that. So, right, so you, you as a taxpayer, you're paying for these people in prison. Wouldn't you want something to happen inside that prison for their behaviour to change. How would you feel knowing that you basically paid for this person to be in prison for <clears throat> five years, for example, for them to come out and reoffend again and again and again? You're basically well, you paying them four grand a month to rent rent a fucking somewhere. Four grand a month if I was renting a little shitty cell. You know, I'd one you know, you're thinking about what four grand can get you. Yeah, <laughs> four well, grand a month could get you, you know, something a nice house, a great education. I get, and the, yeah, we're not getting anything from from these young people, whether they're going in and then they're not coming out any different, are they? If they're reoffending, but they are. There is some stuff in place, isn't there? Like schools within prisons and like. Yeah, there are. Um, again, there's not the resources that that are required for somebody to really be given um, that chance of rehabilitation. So, you know, in some cases, there's not enough prison staff to take that person to that program that they're supposed to be sitting on. Yeah. So, yeah, there are programs in place in prison, but because of staff shortages and a lack of resources, they aren't really um, sufficient or they aren't living up to what they're supposed to do. Mm. One thing that this thing, this uh, little uh, prisonreformtrust.org.uk document um, that we've got here... It said that 
England, Wales, current, England and Wales has an imprison, imprisonment rate of 153 people per 100,000 of the population. France of 96. Yeah, it's the highest in Europe. We 89 are. is Ger- yeah. Germany. Wow. 89 people per 100,000 people. Um, Why is it so bad compared to the rest of Europe? Different attitudes towards offending. Different attitudes towards people. I'd love to know what the figure is for the US. Massive. Can I Google it? Massive. Uh, imprisonment rate. Growing. So instead of adopting the policies that other countries in Europe have, like Norway and Sweden, for example, they have a attitude towards people that if they offend, then the whole of their society has let that person down. Not that that person has let the society down. That's interesting. Yeah. And if you have a look, you should pull up, um, Tom, sorry to <laughs> give you more. <laughs> you should pull oh, up a, a prison cell in Norway. Right. I've, I've seen they that. I've seen this photo before. About the same as student halls in this yeah. in this country. There was something that went around recently, wasn't there? I saw like a, a and it compared like a, a Norway prison to a student. It looks so very what, IKEA. What was the thinking then behind that? Behind having a nice prison in Norway. Um, well, the prisons are reserved for the most serious offenders, and even within them institutions, they are given. Uh, trust and you know they have kitchens they have knives in those facilities they are um allowed to use those things but it's really just attitudes towards people and attitudes towards offenders Mm. and reserve in prison for the most serious offenses which they do in norway and because of that they have really got hardly any people in prison to the extent that i'm sure a few years ago they were renting out their prison cells to other countries jesus probably us (laughs) <laughs> Probably us. Yeah, yeah. Look, it looks looks a decent. To be honest, that looks pretty much similar to what my halls were like in uh, I think in that Leeds. Was nicer than my halls. <laughs> that was nicer. I think that is you, you've hit the nail on here. It's just attitude, isn't it? Like I've already admitted to my attitudes changed. I think if if everyone has a, a different attitude on on people in prison and and some of the some of the criminals yeah. and offences. We're just so punitive as a society. We just want punishment, and these other countries i'm not saying that they have never been like that but they have realized that it's not working Mm. now it's clearly not working in our country but for some reason there's no real change there Mm. instead of following norway and sweden for example we follow the us and instead of thinking oh we've got too many people in prisons instead of trying to address that what do they do they build more prisons that's where it comes into the privatization thing and stuff then doesn't it so in uh the highest was 716 per 100,000 compared to the UK's 158 per 100,000, which is mad. But it's dropped now. In 2019, it had fallen to... Again, Grace, I'm sure you're probably going to have a uh, an opinion on me. Wikipedia. Wikipedia. <laughs> but it's, we have to work with it. 2019, it had fallen to 419 um, people per 100,000. It houses 22% of the world's population of prisoners. Oh my god! <laughs> it's mad, isn't it? And what's this? What's the? Um, it costs around seventy-four billion. Yeah, I mean a year. Who the fucking government goes right? We need to look at a successful prison model. Let's look at America. I mad, mean, isn't it? Of those incarcerated, one I mean, yeah. So that that means zero point seven percent of the U.S. population were in prison. Back. And um, Prissy Patel is quite keen on introducing the death penalty again in this country. So she's going the other way. <laughs> on back, yeah. back to your recommendations, Grace, on here it says um, all a e departments in the UK should have a youth worker in place to offer support to children and young people attending hospitals with violence-related injuries. Again, we touched on that before. I guess that's when they're coming in really vulnerable. Yeah, so uh, like I said before, this was really related to the south of the country. So these organisations are amazing. They're in Birmingham, they're in London, but where are they everywhere else? So it's just rolling that out nationally, really, and making sure that there is somebody there when a child has come in Mm. and where they're really physically and emotionally vulnerable and where they need somebody and probably will discuss um, the details around how they've ended up in the situation that they have. And the last recommendation before I get your thoughts on drug policy is criminal exploitation and county lines training should be made a national requirement for those working with children, young people and vulnerable adults. Now, that seems pretty obvious given everything we've discussed over the past hour or so that people need to be more informed about what's going on. Yeah, I think I easily become desensitised to it and have this belief that everybody knows about county lines now because I'm 
thinking about it, watching it, researching it every single day. But actually, we've spoken to some people for this research in social care, for example, you know, social care who come into contact with children every day who don't know what county lines is, who have had no training on county lines. And actually, um, even social work degrees, I think, only have one module maybe on criminal exploitation and county lines when it's huge. So, yeah, professionals need educating. Children obviously need educating. Parents need educating. Everybody, because it's... I'm going to go and post this to BJ. You're in London next yeah. year, and you're always... I'm in London on Friday, so if you want me to yeah, head to it Downing it. Street, then I'm... This, I mean, the work that's gone into this, and we've tried to cover most of it, I mean, I'd like to think something changes would be made. I mean, I'm looking at you to say, like, yes, they will. <laughs> but I mean, you've fucking got a hope, haven't you? That's something, yeah. that's something. One, one change, I guess, which I don't know how long we've been going for, Tommy, like for time. Yeah, yeah, I know we, you've got to shoot at eight, uh, one hour 20. One hour 20, you know. So the one one thing which would be good to finish on, it's always a good debate, is, is drugs and alcohol. Now, before we started recording, you even made a great point of how we even speak. Like I just have, you know, drugs and alcohol as if they're two separate things. Yeah. You said it's like saying apple and fruit, you know. Yeah, it's, it's just a pointless distinction. So alcohol is a drug. Mm. Mm. It's so weird. Again, it's in behaviours and attitudes, yeah, yeah. isn't it? Why we can say alcohol and drugs. Yeah. So anybody that asks me how we can change this situation, my first response is we need to go and revisit these drug policies. Drug prohibition does not work. And it doesn't, yeah. Drug prohibition actually fuels county lines and fuels the violence that we see at the minute. So really, the first thing to do is decriminalise drugs. And then really radically, some people won't like me for saying this either, is to legalise drugs. And really change attitudes towards the people that use them, the people that depend on them. And look at why people depend on them. So, um, a really interesting statistic is 90% of all illicit drug use is not problematic. Only around 10% of um, illicit drug use or drugs that are illegal, 10% uh, is problematic. But we are made to believe that that 10% accounts for 100% of people that use those drugs, right? Mm. So so Go on, go on, mate. Oh, I was going to say that is interesting because you you just assume that you're anyone with a drug problem or taking drugs all of the time and, and involved in crime or you know doing things that you shouldn't be. It's down to drugs where you you then lose you lose fact that there's ninety percent of drug takers who are just I don't know happily maybe responsible people that yeah. can make their own decisions and stop when they don't want any more and take them when they feel like having them and yeah ninety percent of people yeah and I th I would advise anybody who is interested in this to have a read of Professor Carl Hart's book. So he is a professor, I think, at the University of Columbia in America, and he is a heroin user and he's out and proud about it. He's done a lot of research into it. And- Well, he's an open heroin user now. Yeah, works for a university, University of Columbia. <laughs> That's insane. Wow. Professor of psychology, I think maybe even runs the department of psychology in, in um, that university and he is a heroin user and he actively um, discusses his heroin and other class A drug use. Grace, what's his name again? I'm going to have to... Professor have... Carl Hart C. There you are, Carl Hart, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. And he functions okay and he's... Yeah, he's yeah. absolutely fine. In fact, he, he's done a Joe Rogan podcast, so have a listen. He will say that his performance when he is on drugs sometimes is much better than when he's not on drugs. <laughs> so when he, so he, said, he said in this interview in his podcast with uh, Joe Rogan that when he did his TED talk, he'd actually had, I think it was methamphetamine the night before. I, I mean, wrong. meth is a heavy fucking drug, isn't it? I always think of people like. I mean, him. is he going as far as kind of advocating it, and you know? Yeah, yeah, he's trying to change drug laws. He is basically advocating for the fact that people should be free to make those decisions about whether they take drugs or not. So it said, I mean, there's just there's the thing. It says it's great to take MDMA with my wife and reconnect. So this guy doesn't mess about with his. Um... So his book is called um, "Drug Use for Grown Ups." 
uh, beneath the social and moral debate it is vit vital scientific question are recreational drugs harmful in themselves if skunk MDMA cocaine and heroin are dangerous to the individual and ruinous to the community at the large then the case for banning them is strengthened but what if they aren't as harmful as the authorities maintain and what if the damage done to communities should be attributed to poverty and criminalization of drugs rather than psychoactive effects yeah so this is really interesting so everything that we are led to believe about addiction is wrong and again i'm gonna try and instruct ask you to pull up another book because yep. people need to read it it's called chasing the scream chasing the scream and this was written by a guy called Johan ari i think that's how you say his name Oops, again sorry. he's done a joe rogan podcast yeah, it is, yeah, it's tough and one. his whole message of that book is the opposite of addiction is connection and basically everything that we know or we've come to know about addiction is wrong so obviously there are certainly chemical hooks in yeah. the drugs but actually the environment plays a huge factor and one thing i think is really interesting we were having this conversation the other day when you got blown up and you were in the hospital did you have morphine yeah and then did you come out of hospital addicted to morphine no why i don't know <laughs> it's hard to get hard to get in bootle is it well, yeah, yeah. No, one, no one was offering it to me no one Very it wasn't there to get in bootle, oh, it, you know? really? yeah. morphine well it's heroin isn't it oh right yeah so yeah. you know if you go to the hospital you're given diamorphine which is the the medical term for heroin morphine is the exact same it's a, it's much more pure and it's much more safe because it's not bashed with anything that you find on the street yeah no i just didn't I just wasn't addicted. I don't know. I had other things going on, I guess. <laughs> other things going on. You had a support network in place. You know, you you had all the qualities and factors that somebody needs to live a fulfilling life. A nice life, right? yeah. So you didn't become addicted to that. So why then, if the chemical hook is there, it's the same. If we're led to believe that these drugs are so chemically addictive, why then would you not walk out of the hospital with a heroin addiction? Why would you then not want to go and find a, street, a drug dealer on the street and get some heroin? Mm. And it's the same, you know. So fulfillment and connection. Like, yeah. Is the like is the answer? Yeah. So uh, as well as the physiological needs that we have, you know, in terms of needing to eat, needing to sleep, and everything else that goes with that, we have psychological motivations. Um, to be respected, to have an identity, to feel fulfilled, to feel loved. People who, a lot of people who become addicted to drugs don't have those needs met. And instead of forming connections with people, they form connections with drugs. Mm. And the drugs become, you know, people will say that heroin feels like you're being wrapped up in cotton wool. Yeah. That it takes all your yeah. stress away, that you're just fine for as long as you're on it. Mm. Maybe it's not the same in the sense that, that the point I'm going to make, but what I think is funny is uh, my dad smokes and sometimes I don't, well, I don't know, I'd have to ask him, but I don't think it's sometimes the nicotine. It's sometimes it's just something in your habit. habit and it's that habit, yeah, mm. of, I don't, I remember people who would, you know, when it come to smoking outside, you'd go outside to, to, to speak to other people. That yeah, connection. Yeah, social aspect to, to it. Yeah. yeah. So this is really interesting. So in the 80s, when nicotine patches came out, there was a, a huge optimism in people obviously stopping smoking. In that nicotine patch, you've obviously got the nicotine, so you've got the chemical hook, you're still receiving that. Only around 17% of smokers stop smoking with those nicotine patches. But if you're still getting that chemical yeah, hook- Yeah, you're smoking to get that, you're, yeah. You're, you're getting that. Yeah, 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 so yeah. What's happening to the other 70, 80% um, mm. who are still um, addicted. So why? So there's other things in the environment. Of course, yeah. There's that physical habit. You know, you might associate having a smoke when you're driving to work or when you're coming home from work. Yeah. You know, I know people who only have two cigarettes cigarettes a day and that will be when they've just come home from work. Yeah, yeah. That's my mum's the same as that. My mum does that, yeah. Funny enough, I've just, I need to start getting out of this habit, but I've formed a habit. Whenever I'm cooking at night, I'll always have two, three beers. And I'm worried, not worried, because like people are going to, what Slippery the fuck's it, time. what's he on about here? But every night I'm yeah. like, I'll get cook, I'll start cooking and I'm like, oh, do you know what, there's beer, and there's always beers in the fridge. Mm. And I'm like, I mean, I, I, and I've done it for like, I don't know, three, four weeks straight, every single night when I'm cooking, I'm like thinking to myself, right, I should really not, like I should park. Anonymous getting caught next time. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. it is You're so easy. With cooking, yeah, with cooking, yeah. yeah. It sounds mad, but. My, my dad was the same though when, um, my, my granddad was an alcoholic and my dad's seen that firsthand. So we always vowed after he passed away, he'd never have beer in the house for that exact reason. Cause it's, it's there. 
because it's, it's there. It's so easy to have if it's there, isn't it? I don't get fucked up. Like, I'm not zapped every single night, like trying to like, you know, cook. But set your can... house on fire. <laughs> this is a fart. <laughs> what was the story, Grace, about the rats and the um, with the water? Uh, was it? Yeah. So this can be found in this book, Chasing the Scream. So it's I'm not taking credit for this at all, but it is so interesting. So um, I think you know traditionally the reason why that we've got the views that we have is a lot of these studies have been done on rats and um i don't know who it was there was a um, scientist who basically created a cage and put a rat in a cage and there was two water bottles so there was one water bottle that was just water and there was one with water and cocaine inside oh yeah yeah, yeah. remember this every single time that rat who's in this cage on its own would go to that water bottle and drink the cocaine and until within it, probably two three weeks they'd die yeah just until they die yeah. until they yeah, die yeah. yeah so you know because of that study we were then led to believe that oh these drugs are so bad if you take heroin you're going to die in a few weeks and this will happen surely heroin or cocaine cocaine but it you know it can oh, be related it? to other okay. drugs other addictive drugs it's all about addiction so then a scientist called Bruce Alexander came along in the 80s to kind of challenge this thinking that we've got and was kind of like, well, hang on, you've put this rat in an empty cage on its own with nothing that would be fulfilling for it. Of course, it's going to drink the one with cocaine. So what he did is he developed this study where he basically created this rat park and he put everything in this cage that a rat would want. So loads of cheese, all the rats that he could um, have relationships with, uh, the little assault, uh, assault like, like the assault court, yeah, yeah, everything that a rat would want, right? And they put the bottles of water again, one with cocaine in it. They might have tried that bottle of water with the cocaine, but they never went back to it, and they never became addicted, and they really? die. So why? Yeah, it's interesting. Because so they had they good stuff going on in their life. Everything else that they would need. That's fascinating. I do remember that that rat so, thing. I yeah. think I mentioned it to Lee Butler when he was on the podcast about the cocaine, but I never heard the other side of the story. So with with yeah. the assault course, rats flying about on the assault well, course. Well, if they've got a good life, yeah, why? Yeah. So how can that be translated to people? Yeah, exactly. And again, it's a good point. Yeah, really good point. I've never been in that situation, but if I was homeless and I were, you know, had fuck all going on in my life. No family, no friends, nothing to look forward to apart from this little drug. I mean, are you really going to judge me for, for wanting to have a go? Because I've got nothing else going on, mm. you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, problematic drug use really is just masking pain. And you have to look at why people are in pain. Mm. Neil Wood said exactly the same. Yeah, exactly does, yeah. the same. Especially with heroin users. Why, why well. is it then, you know what, what I don't understand? What, why aren't the government, what are the, the be we've just heard that, you know, Drugs, people in prisons, you know, costing thirty six grand a year. The problems that are going on with drugs, the vulnerable people getting exploited, everything like that. The benefits would be you could tax these drugs. Why are they still illegal? Where's the benefit? Well, a lot of people benefit from the drug war. As in governments. As in governments, as in researchers, as in police, other agencies. A lot of people benefit benefit from the drug war. But I think really it's the attitude that we've got in society. It's because people, you know, like yourself, you've just admitted that had you not sought out this information, you would have been one of them people that's kind of like, oh, that would never happen to me or I could never be in this situation. As a society, we hold that view and we dehumanise people and we want justice and we want to see that somebody is paying for what they've done. Now, the only way, really, I think, well, one of the main ways that we can change drug laws is to educate people on this mm. because politicians will only seek to implement the policies that the public um, are in support of, right? So, for example, if you had a new government that were wanting to come in who were really looking to be soft on crime, that does not go down well. And that's why every time a new government comes in, we have tougher laws, tougher, tougher drug laws, sentences. Sentences mm. increase instead of decrease. They want to look tough on crime because that wins votes. So the only way to really change this is to educate people and to get enough public support for it mm. that actually the politicians then want to um, marry up with what yeah. the public wants. To get into power, we're like, we yeah. need to listen to the public. We need to have, yeah. Do you know what though? I reckon if someone did come in in the next election and someone said, 
outright massive claim saying, look, we're going to review all the drug laws and there's a potential that we may well uh, probably decriminalise and maybe even legalise drugs. You know what? I reckon so many people would vote for them. I wish I could agree with you, but I really, don't know. do you not? No, not at all. Maybe because I ha maybe because it's your. I don't know. I just think some people. You're in a different world, as in what you do with work. So, pro possibly not. But I just think a lot of people would suddenly just go I fucking think out. Younger like younger people would. Yeah, yeah younger, younger people. people are very um, liberal and coming around to the idea that things aren't working. On, you know, I think they would. But, you know, I think people assume that if you decriminalise drugs or legalise drugs that you would then have mayhem on the streets and that you'd have people that are basically shooting up heroin on the street corners mm. that things would be anarchy and chaos well how much worse can it get mm. right because we've already yeah. got children being stabbed it's easier for children to get their hands on heroin than it is alcohol yeah and that thing like we said at the start alcohol and drugs it's alcohol is the worst drug when you when you look at you know things it causes yeah, from, yeah. Oh, domestic violence and all the, the yeah, every, talk, everything you, you fighting could talk, you could talk up I mean I don't know I've got no stat this is just my purely my opinion I, surely there have got to be more deaths and crimes committed people pissed as a fart than someone smoking weed yeah I think so surely I think I, I think alcohol and cocaine very very similar similar drugs um yeah would manifest in in somebody as aggression and you then have um physical fights breaking out everything that comes with alcohol yeah is really um i don't know why drugs like cannabis aren't legal and drugs like alcohol are. Mm. yeah, that yeah is it's mad. madness it is mad that one cannabis. thing when we had uh, andy cook on next uh, chief he, he was dead against legalizing it and i, I didn't really didn't really back his arguments where he said, "Well, if they didn't do drugs, they'd do something else." Well, yeah, they probably would, but it's not a reason. That's, that's yeah. not a reason. I, know, I wish we'd pushed him more on that because I do regret. Like I, I was exactly the same as you, mate. Because mm -hmm. like, he, he was like, "They'll then move on to racketeering," or like, but then it's sort of like there's not a reason for not. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't know how you can be in policing for as long as he has been and still agree with the drug policies and the drug prohibition that we've got and mm. not want change. And I, I look at people like Neil Woods and, you know, leap law enforcement against prohibition. They have gone the complete other way. They've seen it. They've seen the mm. harm that it causes and they've gone the other way because they know that this approach is not working. Yeah. And if yeah. you, you know, he was saying something like, oh, I've not seen the evidence. I don't know how you can not see the evidence unless you're not looking for it. So, you know, if you have a look at Portugal, when they um, decriminalized all drugs, I think they legalized them you know so much crime fell i think the crime rate fell by half prostitution pretty much disappeared um people dying from overdoses eradicated how can you then still be in support of these drug laws mm. knowing this mm. and the other um, thing you know say if you are in support of keeping drugs illegal you aren't doing a fucking very good job <laughs> do you know what i mean like you ain't winning this drug war no. like at, even if you were like, right, that's it. We need to. We're going to spend billions, billions on which know, they already do, don't they? What they already yeah, do. You know, if you talk about council lines, they've they've developed the National Council Lines Coordination Centre. I think there was something like twelve million that was put into that, maybe more. Um, if you arrest a county lines network, if you take down one of their phone lines, it'll take about half an hour for that phone line to come back up again. Yeah, yeah. You're not. You're not. You're not, you're yeah, yeah. Chasing mate, the Colombians are still fucking shipping it out, whatever. Oh, whatever they don't, they're doing, they don't give a Frenchman, do they? They're out. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. you, um, do you remember who is? Is it Guzman, that Mexican drug cartel guy? Yeah. His wife's just getting done at the minute. Isn't oh, is she? Oh, is she? Yeah. His son or something got arrested. Then everyone in this area went may it went absolutely mayhem, and then the police released him. They're like, yeah, we're gonna have to. Yeah, yeah. there's yeah. always like a vacuum of to be filled once you take out one drug network or take out one gun <clears throat> they, they, st they started shooting poli like it just like the violence just went mayhem because they'd arrested his and son and they let him go in the end and then they, 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 they let him go they're like yeah it's not yeah, worth I've it I seen a podcast the other week <laughs> and he was talking about the drugs in America and how again how you should legalise it and he said that you know so much for crime because there's certain drug people who are getting done you know, who, who are high up 
and you know they're committing crazy murders they're doing all this but they're that powerful they're getting like five years and they're like right please don't do it again yeah go and it's like this drug it's not working this drug war no so you could take it out of the hands of organized crime groups and use the money regulate the market use the money and put it into schools so places like switzerland who have decriminalized all drugs and i think maybe even legalized heroin for example the money that they are getting from that regulation from that tax they are putting it back into schools yeah and in the long run that will save millions and it's educating them about all the things we've spoken about yeah it's funny though isn't it like the us has legalized cannabis in certain states i don't know if it's gone federal or not but and yet they're very backwards on like the actual drug policies themselves you know like how much money they send so much money and resources over to mexico to try and stop drugs coming in and yet they legalize kind of like it's all very and then we've seen their incarceration rate very strange setup they've got in the us but yeah. anyway mm. grace thank you yeah it's been fascinating and uh thanks for coming back on and telling us about your work i know that you are not in a position to make the changes but i think the work that you've done and the recommendations hopefully will be seen by the right people yeah people just need to read and educate themselves on books like that and reports like that is a start you know if you've got nothing else you've got a voice perfect thank you very much Thanks, and Grace. once again um montrex click the link below in the description 15 percent 15 percent off. off unbelievable company unbelievable clothing the code is leg it right thanks so much <laughs> cheers, cheers thank guys you.